Some say the Bible foretells a time when many will vanish into thin air. A time when the world is plunged into seven years of tribulation. But can this really be supported by the Bible? Join us as we take a look at Left Behind, Fact or Fiction. Hi, I'm Mark Finley. Welcome to another in our Left Behind No More series. Thank you for joining me here on Three Angels Broadcasting. I have a question for you. Simply because something has been taught for centuries, does that make it true? You know, scientists for a long time believed that the Earth was flat. Did that make it true? Scientists for a long time believed that the whole universe revolved around the Earth. Did that make it true, even though those scientists had powerful credentials behind their names? It was much, much later in the Middle Ages that a free-thinking Pole by the name of Copernicus came along, and he said, the Earth is not the center of the universe. The Earth is not the center of our solar system. The Sun is, and the Earth is actually moving, and it revolves around the Sun. Copernicus was ostracized for introducing that new idea because something had been taught for centuries. It must be true. Merely because something has been around for a long time doesn't mean it's true. Because something is popular doesn't mean it's true. Because thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, millions of people accept something, it doesn't mean it's true. On this program today, you may be in for some astounding surprises as we study the Bible together. My topic today is the Antichrist, the Tribulation, and Deliverance. Let's take a look at the sequence of events that lead up to that great event, the second coming of Christ. Let's cut right to the bone. Let's look right at the heart of the question and ask ourselves, what is the issue in the final crisis between good and evil? What's the issue in the great controversy in these last days of Earth's history? When you really look at the issues that are involved in what it means to be a Christian, the central issue is worship. If you look through the entire Old Testament to be a follower of God, the central issue was worship. In the days of Egypt, when the Egyptians took the Israelites as slaves, the central issue was worship. In the days of Israel in Babylon, you have the challenge of the false gods in the true God, the issue was worship. In the days of Daniel, the issue was worship. In the days throughout the Old Testament, the Prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, called back to true worship. You look at the end of the Old Testament, Amos and Hosea and the minor prophets called back to worship. John the Baptist called back to true worship. So down through the centuries, the apostles and disciples and prophets of the past focused on the subject of worship. So it should not surprise us in the last days of earth's history that the central issue in the final conflict revolve around worship. In Revelation chapter 14, God gives his final appeal to the world. In Revelation 14 verse 6, he says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. An angel flying in mid-heaven. A heavenly messenger with an urgent message to go to the ends of the earth, a message that leaps across geographical boundaries, a message that goes to every language group and every culture in the world. The message says with a loud voice. Now, what kind of a voice? A soft voice. A soft voice? Not at all. A what? A, a loud voice. The message says with a loud voice. Why loud voice? To give emphasis. The message says with a loud voice, fear God. Now, that doesn't mean be afraid. The word there is reverence or respect God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. In other words, we're living in the judgment hour. The clock has struck the hour. The destinies of the entire human race are to be settled. Then the Bible says, worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. So here is a call to worship the one who made. What do we call the one who made? We call him the creator. So here's an appeal to worship the creator. Here's an appeal for true worship. Now, this must be very important. What is the basis of all worship anyway? We look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Why do we worship God anyway? What's the basis of worship? 
For you created all things, and by your will they exist. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why is God worthy of our worship? Because he is our creator. So in the last days of earth's history, at a time of evolution, God calls us back to worship him as creator. Has God given to us a sign of his creative authority? Exodus chapter 20. How do we worship God as the creator? Once you understand this, everything else in the final controversy between good and evil and the conflict will fall in place. You have to understand what's the central issue. And we're driving home that point from the Bible that the central issue is worship. It's our allegiance. It's our loyalty. What is the sign of true worship? What is the sign of our allegiance to God? Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, and the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Here you have it. Revelation says a message is to go to the ends of the earth, calling men and women back to worship the Creator. Revelation 4 says that the essence of all worship is the fact that God created us. Exodus 20 in the Sabbath commandment says that we worship God as creator by remembering the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is much more than some legalistic requirement given to it, the Jewish race in the Old Testament. The Sabbath is an eternal symbol that God created us. It's an eternal symbol that we are his creatures. It's an eternal symbol that links our hearts to God, that we are worshiping the one that made us every time we worship on Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, Saturday. We enter into a heart-to-heart -heart experience with God, the creator of the world. Do you see why the Satan hates the Sabbath? Do you see why the Sabbath will be a central issue in the final conflict? Because it speaks to the heart of who God is and who we are. God is the creator. We are creatures. We come to him with our deepest allegiance, our supremest homage and our worship. Now back to Revelation 14. What is the central issue in the great controversy between good and evil? True worship, loyalty, allegiance, Sabbath. Worshiping the creator. But there is a contrast in verse 9 given. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, he shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. So on this hand, we have the God that created us. We fall at his feet to worship him. On this hand, we have a false worship called worshiping the beast. So here's worshiping the creator and here's worshiping the beast. Now where does this central issue find its heart? Where is the center of conflict in the issue of worshiping the creator and worshiping the beast? What's this all about? Revelation 14 verse 12 tells us. It says, here is the patience of the saints here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the central issue is the commandments of God, and the central issue has to do with that specific commandment doing, dealing with worshiping the creator of the Sabbath. So the Sabbath becomes part of a worldwide controversy at the time of the end. The whole human race is called to loyalty to God. It's called back to worshiping this creator God. It's called back to allegiance to him, and the Sabbath is the symbol of that creation. On the other hand, there is the beast power, the antichrist power, who's tried to change God's law. Are you aware of the fact that the Bible actually teaches that the antichrist power would rise and attempt to change the very law of God? Are you aware of the fact that the Bible teaches that there would be an attempted change in God's law by man? The Bible actually predicts that. Let's look at it. Let's discover this amazing attempt by man to change the very law 
of God. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25 says that a power would rise that would think to change the times and the laws. A power would arise and it would think that it had the authority to change the very law of God. What power is this that would think to change the very law of God? What power is it that would arise and where would this power come from? Now before we go on, we need to pause and go back to the Bible and look at Daniel, the seventh chapter. And here in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to discover just who this power was. We're going to discover how this power tried to change God's law. We're going to discover the identity of the Antichrist power according to the Bible. Now let me remind you, the word Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ. There are some that think the word anti means against. Anti also means another. So when one claims the privileges and prerogatives of God, that one becomes another Christ. They try to take over or assume the position that is only Christ or only God's. In Daniel, the seventh chapter, the Bible describes the rise and fall of empires in the imagery of four beasts. Daniel 7 and verse 1 says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four beasts came up from the sea, different from each other. Now here Daniel saw a windy seascape. And he saw four beasts come up out of the sea, different from each other. Now, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? In Daniel 7 and verse 17, the Bible says, Those great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So the four beasts are what? Four what? Kings or, verse 23 says, Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. So the Bible talks about four kings or four kingdoms. A king or a kingdom is interchangeable. There'll be four kingdoms that would arise. Now notice we're going to study these four kingdoms. The four kingdoms are represented as beasts. The first was like a lion that had eagle's wings. The first beast or the first kingdom that would dominate the earth would exist in Daniel's day. What nation overthrew Jerusalem that was ruling in Daniel's day? And was it symbolized in both history and archaeology as a lion? The nation of Babylon overthrew Jerusalem. And Babylon is represented as a mighty lion. Jeremiah says, Babylon, you are a lion's whelp in Jeremiah chapter 51. Archaeologists uncovering Babylon. And incidentally, the modern country of Iraq is the country that Babylon was located in. And uh, the city of Babylon was located probably 90 or 100 miles south of Baghdad. As archaeologists have uncovered the ruins and remains of Babylon, they have discovered a lion with eagle's wings as a motif or symbol on the walls. They have discovered as well lion with eagle's wings and some of the old coins of Babylon. They have discovered a basalt lion with eagle's wings. The Bible says that another beast would rise, and the Bible describes that in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 5 as a bear. This bear has three ribs in its mouth. The nation that overthrew the Babylonians was Medo-Persia. And when Medo-Persia overthrew Babylon, Babylon, it had three ribs. It destroyed three nations, Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon to conquer the world. And so the Medo-Persians rose by destroying Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon. This bear, the bloodthirsty Medo-Persians, the second beast, the second empire. The Babylonians ruled from 605 to 539 B.C. Then the Medo-Persians rose to rule from 539 to 331 B.C. The third beast arose, or the third empire, and it describes it here in the Bible. 
It says, Daniel 7, verse 6, After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on the back four wings, and it had four heads. If you wanted to describe rapid conquest, what beast would you choose? A leopard. If you wanted to describe rapid, 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 rapid conquest, what would you do with your leopard? You would put four wings on it. And so God put wings on the leopard to describe the rapid conquest of Alexander the Great of Greece, who overthrew the Medo-Persians. Greece would not rule forever. A fourth beast arose. Verse 7, dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong. Babylon was overthrown by Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia was overthrown by Greece. Greece was overthrown by this fourth beast of what? What nation overthrew Greece? You're exactly right, it was Rome. And this beast, this fourth beast, has ten horns, the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. So Rome arises with ten divisions. As Daniel is looking at these ten horns of this fourth beast, the Roman Empire, he says, I was considering the horns, the ten divisions of Rome, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. So here's a little horn, a power that's small at first but grows to world dominance. It comes up after the breakup of the Roman Empire. Rome ruled the world from 168 B.C. to 351 A.D. From 351 A.D. to 476 A.D., Rome fell apart. Sometime after 476, a power would arise. That power would arise by destroying, according to the Bible, three of the horns, or it would destroy three of the divisions of Rome. So we ask ourselves the question, what power grew out of pagan Rome. What power as it grew out of pagan Rome came after the breakup of the Roman Empire? What power grew by destroying three horns? It says, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. Eyes in the Bible are a symbol of wisdom. According to Ephesians 1 verse 18, the Bible talks about the eyes of understanding. This power does not have the eyes of God, it has the eyes of a man. What do we call a prophet? A prophet in the Bible is called a what? A seer. Why is a prophet called a seer? Because a prophet sees not with human eyes, but with God's eyes. So this power that comes up out of Rome doesn't have divine wisdom. It doesn't see with the eyes of God. It sees with the eyes of man. So here's a power coming out of Rome that is based on human wisdom. The Bible then goes down Further, in describing this power, in Daniel chapter 7, and you'll notice verse 20, it says about the ten horns that were in its head and about the other horn that came up that had eyes, it spoke pompous things. It says, I was watching, the same horn was making war with the saints. So here's a power that speaks proud things against God. It asserts its authority above God. Here is a power that persecutes those that don't go along. And it's, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 that this power would think to change the very law of God. He would be, verse 24, the last part, different than all other powers. Now this is quite amazing. Here is a power that would grow after the breakup of the Roman Empire, after the ten horns were Ten divisions of Rome were destroyed. Here's a power that would grow up out of pagan Rome. Here's a power that would grow up after the Roman Empire went down. Here's a power that would be different from all other powers according to the Bible. It would be religious and not political. So we're looking for a religious power that grew out of Rome. This power, according to the Bible, would think to change the very law of God. And that change would be the center of a controversy between good and evil. Do we have a power that has grown up out of Rome that has claimed that it had the authority to change the law of God? Could it be that the church of Rome has pretended that it had the authority to change the very law of God? Let's look for a moment at the Catholic Encyclopedia. And we read something quite amazing in the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 4, page 153. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, of the seventh day of the week, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept as the Lord's day. Now, notice this carefully, that in the Bible, the fourth commandment is the Sabbath commandment. Why does the Catholic Encyclopedia call it the third commandment? Because the first on imagery or idol worship, because the commandment on idol worship or imagery, 
the second commandment was dropped. And so that moves the fourth up to the third on the Sabbath commandment. And the last commandment was, was divided into two. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods to get ten. But the Catholic Encyclopedia claims that the church changed the Sabbath from Saturday the seventh day to Sunday the first day. Look at what it says in St. Catherine's Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995. It says, now this is a very recent statement, perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. Then the Catholic newsletter goes on. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. What is the central issue here? The central issue is, does any church or any earthly power have the authority to change God's word. Do you see what the issue is in the last days? The issue in the last days is not a battle in the Middle East. The issue in the last days is not a battle in the temple at Jerusalem. The issue in the last days is not a battle with the Jews. The issue in the last days and the Antichrist, that whole issue, the issue is the law of God. The issue is a human earthly power has arisen that claims that it can change God's very law. And the very law that it attempted to change was the law having to do with our worship of the Creator, the Creator that created us, the Creator that flung the worlds in space, the Creator that launched life on planet Earth. So the devil has struck at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian, and that is to worship God by an attempt to change the very law of God. Notice this statement that is a very clear, plain statement by Cardinal Gibbons in the book, The Faith of Our Fathers. He says, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The Catholic Cardinal says that there's nothing in the Bible authorizing Sunday. Now, I recognize, friends, that there are many honest, Bible-believing Christians who don't understand what the final issue is at the time of the end. I recognize that there are many honest, Bible-believing Christians who love Jesus and worship on Sunday. But God is sending a message, an earnest last-day message, and the devil has given us a diversionary tactic. The devil has caused millions of people to think that the mark of the beast has to do with a world leader who arises out of the UN and, has to, and tries to have one central world government and that there's something to do with the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. The issue is not so far as the Middle East. The issue is in our minds. The central issue is worship and it has to do with being faithful to the commandments of God. There's a conflict over the commandments of God and the commandments of men. There's a conflict over the traditions of God and the, the traditions of men and the Word of God. There's a conflict over what man teaches and over what God teaches. There's a conflict over what human beings have written and what God wrote on tables of stone with his own finger. The central issue is the Sabbath. In fact, look at what the Converts Catechism says. The Converts Catechism raises this question. It asks the question, which is the Sabbath day? Now, this is the catechism, and here's the answer. In the Convert's Catechism, written by Father Pierre Gierman in 1948, it says, which is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Next question in the catechism says, why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? Answer in the catechism. Now, this is the catechism. You, these things are documented because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The church changed the day, but what does the Bible say? Notice Psalm 89, verse 34. I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. So God says that he is not going to alter the word that has gone out of his lips. And today, God is appealing to us to keep 
is Sabbath. The central issue in the final conflict is the commandments of God. Look here in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. The Bible tells us in Revelation 12 and verse 17, the dragon, who's that? Satan was enraged. What's that mean? Angry. With who? With the woman. In Bible prophecy, the woman is pictured as the church, if she's a pure woman. A harlot woman is pictured as the fallen church. But here the Bible says the dragon Satan is angry with the woman with the true church and goes to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God in the last days of earth's history. God is going to have a people that love him so much that they keep his commandments. These commandments are not legalistic requirements. These commandments are not commandments given by a God that wants to restrict our freedom. These commandments are symbols of love that we have with our Creator. And the heart of that Ten Commandment law is the Sabbath. In Revelation 14, verse 12, our Lord tells us, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that are faithful. Here are those that hang on. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. God will have a group of people that have faith in Jesus, a group of people that love Jesus, a group of people that want to obey Jesus, and they keep His commandments. And the Sabbath is the center of that commandment-keeping people. Revelation chapter 22, it's the center or symbol of their obedience. Jesus is the center of their faith. The Sabbath is the symbol of their obedience. Revelation chapter 22 says, and verse 12, 13, and onward, Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Jesus is coming, friend. He's coming soon. And he says, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who's a thirst come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Blessed are they, the Bible says, who do his commandments that they might have right to the tree of life. Christ is coming. He's coming quickly. An antichrist power, a power that grew out of Rome, has attempted to change God's law and substituted Sunday for the Bible's Sabbath. The final conflict between good and evil will be over the allegiance of our heart. Will you give the allegiance of your heart to Christ? Will you surrender your life to Christ? Will you make a decision to follow him all the way and keep his Sabbath as a symbol that he's your creator and your Lord? Will you do that right now as we pray? Dear Lord, thank you that you called us to worship you as our creator. We give you our allegiance and our homage and surrender everything to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen.